we didn't well we didn't really start out to to sort of use maths to clean up our oceans but i think having now done the project that's sort of where it led so um the idea is our oceans are pretty polluted it's a very famous uh, photo i think it was taken last year um, so this whale has eaten 64 pounds of plastic which then caused it to um, to die and it may not possibly sound that much I mean, maybe it does, but if you convert 64 pounds of plastic for a 100,000 pound whale, that's equivalent to one of us eating six Tesco carrier bags. So it's quite a ridiculous amount um, of plastic. Um, and it turns out that 80% of pollution in the marine environment comes from the land. Most of this is through fertilizers, washing through the soil, sort of runoff um, from, from oil and different things sort of, it all kind of comes from the land, enters the river system and then hits the ocean. So in terms of cleaning up our oceans, you actually want to first of all focus on the source of all that pollution, which is the land and which is rivers. And so what I looked at in my uh, PhD was trying to understand the question, which was where does river water go when it enters the ocean? So that's sort of the big picture question. It's, so we have the water cycle, right? So you have um, water, uh, rains from clouds, it's on the ground, it goes into the rivers, and then the river flows into the ocean, and then the water is evaporated back up into the clouds. That's sort of the standard uh, water cycle, which of course is correct. But I wanted to focus more on, well, when it's in the river, and then the river water flows, flows through the river, hits the river mouth, and then goes into the ocean, and then it's that question, where does it actually then go? Because if the river is containing all of the pollution, if we can model and understand and predict where that river water actually goes within our oceans, you then know the areas most susceptible to pollution and you know the areas where you can concentrate your cleanup operations to try and fix the problem. That was sort of the, the motivation behind it. And now it's going to get super mathsy because I did a maths PhD. So that's the setup and we want to model this, this situation. Um, and I've got a couple of images here of um, the North Sea. So that's the same uh, region shown. So obviously this is the UK on the left here and in the black here. Um, let's start with this one. So here you have, um, about here, you've got the River Rhine um, flowing out into the North Sea. And this is a measure of density. And basically, where it's red is fresh water. So if you look at this, your river's coming out here, and it is not simply spreading out in all directions. It is very clearly turning to the side and then flowing along the coast, and it's being confined along that coast based on that, that image. And you see a similar thing here. So this is sea surface temperature. So the river water is colder. And again, you can see sort of the river Rhine is about here and it's coming out and it's concentrated very much along the coast as well with those lighter green shades. So this is sort of roughly giving you a feel for what's going on. Your river is flowing into the ocean and it turns out that the rotation of the earth is sort of the leading thing in controlling where that water goes. Um, so um, let's look at this a bit more closely. I've sort of given, I've already given away my, <laughs> one of my key points, but anyway. So this is a, uh, a little schematic of a river. So here's your river flowing in. We know that it turns and flows along the coast. So in the Northern Hemisphere, it goes to the right, in the Southern Hemisphere to the left, due to the, the switch in the Coriolis force. Um, and so you sort of ask yourself the question, well, what else might affect where this river water goes? So um, I've got a list of things here. Um, so I've mentioned the Earth's rotation, discharge rate. So of course, if there's been a lot of rain, there's going to be more water leaving your river. So you might expect that to influence where that water actually goes and how that river water behaves in the ocean. Um, the actual density difference. So the ocean is roughly constant salinity, but you can have different changes in salinity within your river. So that's going to change the, the uh, sort of the, the density, yeah, the, well, the density difference between the river water and the ocean. And then there are other things. You've got wind and waves, of course, are going to affect where this water goes. Tides, bathymetry, which basically just means the shape of the riverbed. Um, and then you can also think of like sort of almost like human impacts, so like industry. You know, have we like built a big sort of dock or harbour along the coast? Is that going to influence things? So you can get super. You can make this problem really, really complicated. Because it is really complicated, there's so many different things that are going to affect where this river water actually ends up. But the approach that, that we use in, um, in maths is basically to say, well, I can't model everything. So I, as a, as a scientist, have to say, well, these are what I think are the most important things. And let's just focus on them and try to understand them. 
Because if I understand the most important things, then at least we've got some kind of foothold on the problem. So sort of rather than not having a clue, it's like, well, we've got a little bit of a clue. We've got like that starting point. And the way we did it was to focus on these three. So we're going to look at the rotation rate, the discharge rate, so the flux of water leaving, and the density difference, so how salty versus how fresh your two uh, river water and ocean water are. And I did this using experiments. So here's my, my fish tank, uh, and it literally is a fish tank. It's about a meter cubed, uh, which is in the lab in Cambridge. And this whole thing is mounted on a turntable, which rotates. And what basically is happening, so here's a schematic showing the same thing. You've got fresh water here in this reservoir, flows down a pipe, enters through what I've labeled here as the source. This you can think of as your river. This is your river channel. This feeds in fresh water to the saltwater tank. So you've got your tank filled with salt water, fresh water shoots in, and that's going to hopefully behave like a river. That's the plan. Um, and I've labeled here the three key parameters, because these are going to come up again in the formula. So they're also color coded to help everyone. So we've got green F is rotation rate. So I'm going to perform lots of different experiments where I spin my tank at different speeds to see what effect that has. I'm then going to do, again, lots of different experiments varying Q, which is the volume flux. So how much fresh water is leaving my river? And then I'm going to vary how salty and how, well, my fresh water I'm going to keep purely as fresh, and I'm going to change the salinity of my salt water. So that results in a change in the density difference, and that's going to be G prime, which is um, in yellow. Um, I don't need to talk about that. So here is going to be a video of an experiment. So the river comes in here. Because of the rotation, it turns to the side, and then it begins to flow around the edge of the tank. So this is matching what we could see in those satellite images. The river water is entering because of the rotation, because of the Coriolis force. It turns to the side, and then it's flowing along the coast, the coast here being the edge of my tank. Um, let this progress a little bit. So the color represents depth. Um, so I've dyed the water here with uh, red food coloring. And then you can sort of do a, uh, a calibration to figure out the um, amount of light that shines through and convert that into depth. Don't need to go into the details. But basically, red is shallow. Then it goes through to yellow, then green, and then blue little bits are the deepest. So, but you can sort of see what's happening here is it's shallower at the edge. It gets deeper. There's a large um, sort of, I call it the outflow vortex, like a big whirlpool at the river mouth. And then you get this current flowing along the coast. So what I decided to focus on was, well, let's understand the current more. First of all, because it's a little bit easier mathematically, but that's sort of, that's what's going to carry the pollution along the coast. So we want to understand that current and, and some properties of it. Um, you can also take this data and show it in 3D, which I've got on this one here. So this is the same thing, but just you can now sort of see the depth. Um, it's quite spiky, but you can see the current here propagating. And then over time, it gets a little bit deeper. Um, and then the prettiest one. So what we've done here is fill the, the water with glass beads and then shine light through them. And then you take a time lapse picture. So the water's coming out from the bottom. It's turning here to form this spiral and then flowing along the coast. So you get a really nice feel here for, here for what's sort of going on with the, the velocity and the patterns within that river outflow. Um, so uh, how on earth do you model this? Uh, you start with what are called the Navier-Stokes equations. They model the flow of every fluid in the world. Um, you actually get a million dollars for understanding these properly. Uh, it's a real prize um, because we don't really understand them very well. So the point is we have these equations that model this, but we don't really know what's going on with them. So we make lots and lots of assumptions. Similar to what I said at the start, it's too complicated. We've got to simplify things. So I make all of these assumptions. It doesn't really matter what they are. Um, and what I end up with, is this really nice formula for the current depth. So I'm going to say my maximum current depth occurs along the wall, and I'm going to call it h naught. So if we go back to this, so I'm saying that the current is deepest next to the wall, and then it gets shallower as I move away from the coast. Hopefully makes sense. You can kind of see it here. You can see it in that one as well. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I get this nice formula, and I'm going to put back in our color codes because here I have a measurement of how deep my river current is in terms of my rotation rate f, my volume flux q, and my density difference g. And that's it. That's just a simple plug those numbers in, go to a river, measure those things, plug those numbers in, and this tells you how deep your river current is. It's really nice. Let's do the same thing. Let's get a measurement for the width. So how wide is my current? How far away from the coast does my river current extend? 
Again, it's, it's just given in terms of those three important parameters, the G prime, the Q, and the F. And then finally, you get the velocity. It's got a weird number at the front, but otherwise, it's just in terms of those three same parameters. So what can we do with this data? Well, um, here are some experimental results. So this is the depth over time. So I've measured the depth at one point next to the wall here. So obviously, it's basically at zero at the start. There's a bit of fluctuation because it's, it's experiments. There are lots of errors in experiments. Um, so there's a bit of fluctuation. Then the current hits. So it starts to increase in depth, increase in depth, and it kind of flattens off. So it's sort of asymptotically tending towards this final depth. And the blue line, this final depth, comes straight from that really nice, simple formula. So my experiment is matching what my theory is saying should happen. And then I can do the same thing with the width. Um, the matching here, so here, um, starting at the bottom, you move across the current. So the current next to the wall is here. So it's deepest at the wall here. So you can see four centimeters matches the four up here. And then sort of, it's not the clearest uh, plot, but <laughs> you can kind of, it's not too far away from matching. Um, and then you can also measure the velocity. If you look at the first few things here, so the current front is given here. And then a few seconds later, three seconds later, it's here. Three seconds later, it's here. Three seconds later, it's here. So this is sort of following the current along um, there. Um, and then if you compare it to real data, so uh, based on the numbers for the River Rhine, the, again, the satellite image I showed at the beginning, uh, the theory predicts a depth between 5 to 10 meters. And you can measure how deep the river current coming out of the River Rhine is. It's about 10 meters. It's pretty nice. Uh, the width predicted between 10 and 20 meters away from the coast. You can measure that. It's about 20 kilometers as well. Sorry, not meters, kilometers. And then the speed, again, predicted about 0.25 to 0.5. And it's measured about 0.5. So those very simple formulas, formulae, are actually giving us useful information. You just go to a river, you measure three things, and suddenly now you know where your river current goes, you know how deep it is, you know how far away from the coast it is, and you know how fast it moves. So let's imagine you want to clean up, um, for example, a really practical use of this where they should have used my, my work, was uh, in Tokyo. So they're currently cleaning up Tokyo Bay for the Olympics. And their current approach, which is fine, is drag a huge nano net to capture all the plastic in the ocean and the pollution behind a boat. And they are just zigzagging their way across the entire of Tokyo Bay. But with sort of you know, being a bit smarter about it, you could basically use some kind of modeling like this to look at where is the pollution going to actually be concentrated in Tokyo Bay. And you, know, you could put the numbers into my model, and it would say, well, it's only going to be in the top 10 meters for example. So you only need a net that drops down 10 meters, because the pollution will not go below that, because it's trapped in the river water, not the ocean water. And you wouldn't need to go beyond, again, in this situation, you wouldn't need to go beyond 20 kilometers away from the coast. You could just focus on that, that sort of near coast area. So that's sort of practical uses. Um, we haven't had much luck getting anybody to actually use it in that practical sense. Um, but as I said, that wasn't what we started with. It was more like, this is an interesting maths problem. Um, and then ultimately, we sort of got this information, and it seemed like it could be really useful um, in terms of being used for helping us clean up our oceans. Um, so, and I think that brings you to the end of my talk. Whoops, not that one. That one. Um, so I do also have uh, a website, and I'm on social media, Tom Rocks Maths. And I have, I've written um, six articles where I explain this in really simple terms. I wrote them with my mum and dad in mind, who are Bless them. Not, uh, they didn't go to university, shall we believe it that way? So, um, so yes, yeah, so if you want to find out a bit more, there's some more information there. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.